fusion produces very uh, good quality heat. It's available at, at high temperature. Um, so for things like chemical processing, uh, hydrogen production, and anything that uh, could potentially make use of high temperature heat, uh, Fusion also has something to, to offer. Hello and welcome to Energy Unplugged by Aurora. This podcast features various experts from Aurora having in-depth conversations with key industry leaders, policymakers and academics from all over the world. It explores the hottest topics across the energy market and gives a unique perspective on major energy issues. Welcome to Energy Unplugged. I'm John Feddersen, co-founder and chief executive of Aurora. And on the show today, I'll be speaking with a guest who is leading efforts in the UK and Europe to make nuclear fusion, that's fusion with a U, a reality within the time span of a decade or two. My guest on the show is Jonathan Carling, CEO of Tokamak Energy. Welcome, Jonathan. Hi. And just briefly, by way of broader background, Jonathan's history is very much sort of a strong British engineering pedigree. He was an engine designer at Jaguar, Aston Martin and Rolls-Royce, where he focused on both jet and vehicle engines. So he knows this, this industry and how to make actual things in the UK better than most do. Um, Jonathan, could I start by asking you a broad question? What exactly is it that Tokamak Energy does? Yeah, Tokamak Energy develops fusion technology, clean, CO2-free, safe technology for providing electricity and, and industrial heat. Um, and it'll be a key part of the energy mix in, in the coming decades. And, and what we do is actually build stuff. We've built uh, mm-hmm. three Tokamaks now. Uh, the one we've currently built has already run at temperatures hotter than the center of the sun and is about to run much hotter than that um, after uh, a, an extensive upgrade program. And the, the device after that will be demonstrating uh, fusion power. The device we plan to build for 2025 will demonstrate uh, fusion power, not grid connected, but it's our aim to build a grid connected fusion demonstrator around 2030. I was looking at some of doing some research on Tokamak and one of the, I don't know if it's still your kind of, your sort of um, strap line. It says a faster way to fusion. Can you briefly say something about what's different between your technology and other attempts globally um, to, to deliver grid scale fusion technology? I think one of the big big differences is we're a private company. Uh, We're mostly privately funded. Um, and we run like a startup, not like a, a government laboratory. Um, we're 10 years old. We've raised over 130 million pounds uh, to date. So we're not a tiny mm-hmm. company, but the way in which we're able to operate with private back- backing uh, supports us working a more agile way. Interesting. And our our mm-hmm. technology, um, the high temperature superconducting magnets and use of a spherical tokamak, these are both technologies that make the fusion device more in, more efficient and more compact. And that means that we can build smaller devices that are still relevant to the technology that we're developing. And ultimately our aim is to be the technical authority and licensor of this technology. We don't want to run around the world pouring concrete and building power stations. We want to do that with uh, industrial and construction partners and, and suppliers. Um, but we're developing the key technology that's going to be needed to make fusion power a reality. Mm -hmm. Do you, and it's interesting when I, when I ask you about the innovation that you focus on sort of startup and private sector, I suppose it sort of parallels to, at least in my mind, what SpaceX has done or some of those other private um, aerospace companies compared to sort of NASA and basically doing exactly the same thing, but just, doing it much more cheaply and much more efficiently. Do you, do you draw, and you know, NASA ultimately, I think has, has decided it's better off subcontracting to some of these organizations. Do you draw inspiration from the SpaceX example because of the, the way you, you describe one of your, your competitive advantages? 
There are parallels, certainly. Um, one big difference is, of course, that space travel had been done before and this hasn't. Yeah. Uh, so we're not just looking to be a more agile private version of what's gone before. We're, we're aiming to be first. Mm -hmm. um, great. Now, I'd like, to, I'd like to spend quite a bit of time on, on what, what you're doing and where you are. But before I do, I didn't want to miss the opportunity to ask you a bit about your background, um, British manufacturing uh, and and tr you know transport and the internal combustion engine. And so, what strengths and weaknesses do you see in British manufacturing? I think uh, one of the key strengths is that there is a huge amount of engineering uh, competence in the UK. Um, obviously, we've got some very strong universities and some very strong companies. Companies like uh, Rolls Royce that make large fan uh, jet engines. They're one of the few companies in the world that, that can do that. Um, I think one of the weaknesses is that the capital markets in the UK and Europe are less well adapted to suit to um, growing technical businesses and supporting them uh, than in the US, mm -hmm. for example. And then the other part of your background I'm interested in is more recently. So you've joined Tokamak fa fairly recently, uh, as, I, as I understand it. Three years ago, yes. Yeah. What were the what were the ch and, and you know slight deviation from your for, you know obviously senior management uh, in 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 um, engine manufacturers, for example, you different slightly different field. What were the major challenges in transitioning into this you know adja adjacent field with far more speculative technology? I think it's uh, it's generally a question of uh, adaptability and and adapting. So moving from uh, Jaguar Land Rover to Aston Martin is, is quite a transition because of the re reduction in scale. Uh, moving into uh, aero engines uh, brings other changes. The, the common theme is that um, people are people and uh, adaptability is, is always essential. So when I came here, what I found was um, a great business where my experience and the, the science base of the company were, were a pretty good match. And it's a question of growing the business in strength and capability as the scale of what we're doing increases. When I joined, I think there were about 39 people in the, the company and now there's about 120. And uh, we're growing at, at quite a rate. And the things that the company was doing 10 years ago don't necessarily work at scale. As you get bigger, you need to understand the industrial dimension of what you're doing, how it's going to play out into end markets and, and so on. Um, so I found that I have to bring the skills and experience that I already have uh, and adapt it to a new situation. Mm -hmm. It's very, very interesting and, and, and good fun. And we're lucky to have a great bunch of people that we're, that we're working with here. Uh, very smart and very passionate about delivering this. Yeah. Do, do you draw a distinction as a manager? Do you draw a distinction between managing highly technical people and less technical people? Do you think it's a different, you know, can you, for example, you know, ev everybody is different, right? Um, but to some extent you can form a view on, you know, how the best way to interact with someone in general. Do you, do you find that's a useful distinction in your, um, in, in your management as, as chief executive? No, I think it's, uh, it's a bit of a, a cliche uh, to assume that technical people uh, are all sort of classic left brain, uh, socially inept, technically focused individuals who need managing in a certain way. Nor is it the case that just because someone's had a career in financial services, uh, they don't know anything about uh, uh, engineering. So over a number of years, the main thing I've learned is not to assume anything about people and pigeonhole them. And no, I wouldn't, I wouldn't categorize people in, in that way. I think the, the human aspect of their characteristics are every bit, of, if not more, as important as what their background is and, and their knowledge. Yeah, yeah. Do you think, although, do you think your technical background, obviously you've been up through management, do you think that that helps? Is that sort of a sign of credibility to the, you know, to the, to the troops respect you because you've, you know, you've, you've been in the detail? 
Yeah, so I, th I think if you're leading, if you're leading a, a technical business, it does help to have uh, a bit of a technical background. Your, your role is to support the team and grow its capability. And you can probably s support team members, technical team members better uh, if you've got a bit of insight into what their challenges are and what they need. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Um, I'd like to focus, and where I really want to spend quite a bit of time is on the technology and 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 you know where it's going and how how far away it is and these types of things. So, could I start with a, a really broad question, which is, what role do you see fusion playing in decarbonizing our energy system? And I suppose some some kind of slightly provocative context on that is that we've got wind and solar they're super cheap they're super you know so you can build a solar farm in a year you can build a wind farm in two years um they last forever storage costs are coming down and it looks increasingly like these two technologies are going to play a big role they're, they're squeezing out fission you know nuclear fission in, in in many ways and i think people's expectations of those are uh, have diminished over the last decade or so. So where does, what, what, uh, and to me at least, uh, as a non-expert on fusion, I, I envisage it's got similar characteristics for the power system that fission does, right? It's, it's you know, obviously di different safety levels and, and the, uh, different temperatures and all of those sorts of things. But in general, it's sort of lots of baseload power in a, in a reasonably small package. What, what role do you see fusion playing? How's it going to help us with the, with the decarbonisation challenge and satisfying our energy needs? Okay, so in uh, I agree with everything you said. So that's a, okay. a, a good start, <laughs> uh, except maybe the the similarity you draw to to fission. We'll come back to that. Yeah, I thought you might but, want to create a distinction there. Yes, but the um, the the broad um, assumption that um, wind and solar will achieve very high penetration of the uh, electricity market. Um, and be very competitive on cost, really set the standard on cost. I think that's, that's a fair assumption. And if you look at what happens today, the, the intermittency of uh, wind and solar is really covered by uh, natural gas turbines filling in, in the gaps, and there's a carbon-free solution needed to that. Storage is part of that over relatively short uh, durations. But um, across longer durations and seasonal variability and things like that, you, you can't really um, see how there will be enough lithium ion batteries to, to cover that. You've got solutions like uh, carbon capture and storage. Um, we see those as something of an interim uh, solution. It's really a way to allow you carrying, to carry on burning more fossil fuel and, and doing something with it. Um, and it's not as applicable everywhere in the world um, as it is in others. And the, the costs are quite uh, challenging. Where we see fusion fitting in is we think it can be fully competitive on costs. Uh, we've had a couple of external cost studies done that show that we're in the ballpark to be very competitive with other types of energy. And, and Can you give a sense of sort of cost per megawatt hour? Just as a, just obviously no one knows at this point, but roughly what a, are you thinking about? No, not on a podcast like this. I can't jump. Okay, okay, okay. Sign <laughs> <laughs> an NDA and I'll show you the studies. Okay, okay. <laughs> Very good. But cost competitive. So yeah, by, yeah. by that, I would interpret that to mean, uh, you know, in, the, in GB around the 50 pounds a megawatt hour sort of level uh, type of thing. So then you've got... Um, uh other uses of uh industrial heat fusion produces very uh good quality heat it's available at, at high temperature um so for things like chemical processing uh hydrogen production and anything that uh, could potentially make use of high temperature heat uh fusion also has something to to offer um it's it's quite dispatchable. Uh, it doesn't take, uh, it won't take weeks uh, to fire up uh, a fusion plant. You know, it's fairly, fairly straightforward thing to turn on and off. And it would lend itself to quite well to um, various co-generation scenarios, for example, electricity 
or hydrogen production depending on on grid demand so it's a it's a flexible uh, energy source um, which is available when you want it and doesn't have um, big safety barriers. Now, one important aspect of not having big safety barriers means that modularity is a realistic prospect. You don't have to build uh, a mega plant for it to be efficient, and you don't have to build uh, a mega plant because of the regulatory and, and safety hurdles. What I mean is if, uh, if you consider other, other types of uh, modularity, if you've got a big safety hurdle, then every time you make a modular plant, uh, you've you've got various types of safety clearance that are required. Uh, the regulatory burden for fusion is likely to be much lower, so modularity becomes mm -hmm. a realistic prospect, and distributed energy production from fusion is is realistic. So, how big are the how big are the units we might be talking about? Uh, is it sort of you know ten megawatt units or or fifty megawatt units or something like that? Our, um, having having spoken to uh, end users, we think that a module of about one hundred and fifty megawatts is is the right size. Okay. Now, if you want more power than that, you can have um, more modules with a, a common balance of plants. But we think one hundred and fifty is is a pretty optimum size for a module. So, so it sounds like, based on your description, it sounds like, great. I, I, I understand, okay, so storage, you know, lithium ion probably isn't gonna be used for interseasonal storage and these types of things. You can create hydrogen, heat, that type of thing. It sounds a little bit like once, if you pull this off, once fusion is ready, there's really no role for fission. Is that, is that how you see it? Is this a sort of, is this a direct replacement for, for existing nuclear technology? Well, um, I think what you have to take into account is that uh, fission is a moving feast too, and I'm, I'm not going to pretend to understand what uh, that industry's future plans are. We aim to be very comp competitive with wind, solar, and, and storage, and, um, and live in that mix. Mm -hmm. it, uh, natural gas and fission plants uh, will exist, and there's a lot of capital uh, already tied up in them. So I'm not um, proposing that fusion is instantly going to make anybody obsolete. If you look at the energy mix today, it's highly diverse and we expect that to be the case in the future as well. Yeah. Okay. Um, now, in, in terms of where you are as a company, I mean, one of the thi one, one thing that was recently announced was, uh, I think it was 10 million or so in government funding for, for Tokamak to support the work you're doing. Can you can you say a little bit about how important that funding is, um, and and you know what was the what was the process to convince government that it was a worthwhile place to 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 deploy deploy uh, ten million pounds? Yeah. Um, okay. So this money was awarded as part of the government's advanced modular reactor study, um, and there were three recipients. The others. The other two were large uh, fission players, and we were the only uh, fusion player who, who received the grant funding. Um, it, it involved the submission of a detailed uh, feasibility study for uh, a fusion plant and the, the technology required to develop it. Um, we, see, we see it as a very good thing, one, because it shows the government's uh, commitment to fusion as as a technology um, it's in their manifesto and this is an example of them, them uh, doing what they say we think it's good um, uh, recognition of the work we're doing um, it was a big study that we submitted and and the award is uh, is good validation of of the path that we're on and uh, we think that it can't do any harm uh, with a view to att attracting future investment. 90% of the investment into our company is non-government. We, we receive uh, government funding from the, the UK and elsewhere, uh, but of the 130 million that we've raised to date, 90% uh, of that is from private investment. And an investment like this is, uh, is an indication that um, we're, we're doing something serious and that we're making progress 
Mm-hmm. And, and could you briefly say something about the 90% that's private capital? I mean, are these, are these sort of, uh, you know, power station, you know, manufacturers, builders that, that want to license the technology? Are they sort of strategic stakes or, or are they sort of financial investors, venture capitalists type, type thing? Uh, there's a mixture of um, sources of capital and it ranges from a financial institution like uh, Legal in General, who've invested with us over the last uh, three investment rounds, I think, um, through to high net worth uh, individuals such as David Harding, a very successful uh, hedge fund investor who's also invested with us a number of times and everything in between, really. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And and how much do you have a sense of how much capital you will need to get to get to the end point, get to the point where you have a technology that you could license for for for, for people to use? You know, is it is it is it hundreds? Is it tens? Is it hundreds? Is it is it billions? Uh, it's hundreds of millions of, of pounds of investment are required to um, to get to the point that that you described. Mm-hmm. Yeah, interesting. So yeah. Um, so it. Our philosophy is to um, to raise money by doing what we said we would do. Um, we've uh, we built three tokamaks in the past, and uh, and ticking off various technical uh, milestones has has been the key to raising that money. We started as an extremely small company, and the way we've been able to grow is essentially by sticking to our plan and and quietly delivering what we said we would deliver. And uh, one of our next milestones is to take um, the plasma temperatures in our current machine up to over 100 million degrees C, which is the, the sort of level that's required for, for serious fusion. Uh, and after we've, we've done that and demonstrated our large scale high temperature superconducting uh, magnet that we're building now, then we'll be raising some more money. Mm-hmm. It, it, it doesn't feel like a large amount of money in the context of, uh, in the context of, you know, investments that governments make in the energy transition. You know, I think about offshore wind, which was probably billions of pounds back when, you know, back when offshore wind was getting 150 odd pounds per megawatt hour to generate. You know, we were looking at the tidal lagoon in Swansea Bay, and I think that was 1.3 billion in, in support. Do, do you find that that sort of level of, funding makes it easier for government obviously it's probably a bit more spec you know you don't get the the kit you don't get the big kit makes it easier that that we're talking about these smaller amounts of money i think as we start to raise and spend more obviously we'll be interested in the support that governments can can give us um our next device is um a, a a big project um Obviously, if we're raising hundreds of millions, then we're, we're spending it in the economy and um, any support we can get from governments is, is very welcome. But mm-hmm. uh, our whole philosophy is to be a privately funded company and ultimately we won't be uh, reliant on government support to develop this technology. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's a lot of capital out there in the world capital markets for new disruptive technology uh, and this this is definitely disruptive. Yeah, I think yeah. it's actually quite uh, a risky thing to do to have a technical proposition which is completely dependent uh, upon government support. Uh, mm-hmm. Because if that support uh, disappears for whatever reason, then you don't have a project. Yeah, yeah, indeed. And I, I, I recently had on uh, Mark Shark, who developed the Swansea Bay Tidal Lagoon, which is probably a good example of. A good example of that, and I think his lesson was: I wanted, I want to do this privately now, uh, after after years of government uncertainty. And, and at the same time, guy, guy Newey, who was, you know, he, I think he he was he was one of one of the architects of this small modular reactor support scheme under Amber Rudd, uh, and so, you know, talking about the uncertainties and challenges in 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 building a coalition politically to support a technology over over the sorts of periods of time you need. To see to see them through, which is often you know decade decade or more. Uh, so I'm not surprised to hear that in in in, in a sense. Um, could you talk a bit about you talked about the next uncertainty that you need to resolve? What are there? 
what are the big uncertainties that you will be resolving on on the trajectory to having something that's ready to go ready to connect to the to the grid yeah i think i'm not sure if i did say uncertainty uh, we certainly have milestones to yeah, deliver sorry yeah and we um, uh, the reason i don't think of them as as uncertainties is because we have a plan we we have technologies that we need to validate and then build into the, the, the following uh, devices. Um, and it's, it's certainly true that we, we're building a large scale uh, high temperature superconducting uh, magnet, because although we've already set the world record for the highest magnetic field in, in an HTS uh, magnet, um, we we need to prove that that still works at, at very large scale. Um, although we know that the advantages of a spherical tokamak in terms of uh, efficiency are well established, um, the device we're testing now is the world's highest performance uh, spherical tokamak. It, it uses a, a magnetic field to compress the plasma that's two or three times the size of any other spherical tokamak, whether it's in a, in a government or elsewhere. Um, we need to test these uh, devices and run other technology programs uh, in order to be ready to take uh, the next steps. But what's important from our point of view is that we're doing that in a programmatic way where we understand how each element will be delivered and we don't go to the next step and, until it's been done. Mm -hmm. Okay. And what's the, what, what do you see as the more difficult bit, the getting the technology right or, or bringing investors along, raising capital along the way? Um, I think the technology is harder and I'll tell you why. Um, there are lots of people in the world who are able to raise large sums of money for uh, high risk, high reward type uh, projects. Um, and some of them are not very, not very difficult things uh, to do, and some of them are not very plausible things to do, uh, but they always seem to be able to raise uh, capital. Lots of people have tried to deliver fusion energy and haven't. There's, there's not a precedent. This is, this is a world first, uh, and that's why I think it's harder. Having said that, raising money is difficult because this, uh, this is a, a difficult thing to achieve. Uh, and some people think it's, it's just not possible. But I think those same people, if, um, if they'd spoken to us um, three or four years ago, and we'd said, well, we're going to raise 130 million and uh, build and test all of this equipment, they might have been doubtful about that too. And the, the answer is you've just got to get on and do it. Um, and paddle your own canoe. That's that, yeah. that's our philosophy. Make a plan, raise the money, deliver the milestones, and um, and do things. Yeah, yeah. It's it's never very hard to find doubters when you're trying something new. Is is is, is my experience in general. Um, yeah, how okay. how how big is the opportunity for Tokamak? Do you think globally? I mean, do you is it a winner take all type proposition? Do you do you get the technology license that you're the only game in town? Or, or, you know, will there be var variations on this, this technology? I think there's a first mover advantage, certainly. And um, we're, we're not in the race to be second. Um, there are other companies around the world trying to uh, deliver this. I think that's another sign that fusion is coming, is that we're not the only well-funded, serious fusion company in, in the world. Um, but whoever gets there first um, has the first opportunity to license and begin the, the rollout of, of their technology. Mm -hmm. um, having said that, uh, we don't think that whoever's first is going to have a lifelong monopoly on fusion energy. The market just won't allow that to happen. So we're not assuming that by getting there first that we will be the licensor of uh, every fusion plant that ever gets built. That's, that's just not realistic. And our plans don't assume that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Interesting. Very interesting. Um, 
that's probably a good point to, to, to move on. And what, what I'd like to do is conclude with a, a few sort of overrated, underrated questions to sort of draw out your perspective on, on topics relative to what the rest of the industry, what rest of humanity thinks about them. Uh, so let me provide a couple of concepts and I'd be interested to hear your thoughts on whether they're overrated or underrated. So the first concept is government's role in driving innovation. Uh, do you think it's overrated or underrated? I'm not sure um, how most people rate it, actually. Mm -hmm. um, I think you've got, you've got some innovators who think it's very important and a key part of getting their business model uh, rolling. And I think at the early stages, um, support from governments can, can be very, very important. Um, the reason I think it might be overrated is because if you look at major technological progress, maybe outside of wartime, it's often driven by non-government uh, organizations. Mm. You know, commercial pressure and the pull of the market is probably what drives most innovation uh, in the world. Um, yeah. Well, I do think government has a role to play especially in the early stages of the emergence of a technology when the market may not be able to see what's coming. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. The sort of fundamental research argument. It's an interesting point you make it. It feels like public, you know, what humanity thinks about government's role has evolved a lot, I think, over the last 15 years. I think 15 years ago, you know, the general mantra was government is good at picking losers, not at picking winners. Uh, and you know, get get out of the way and set the framework. Uh, but in the last five or so, I think the you know the return of the state. We've got a Department of Industrial Strategy now in the UK, which is mirrored around the world in terms of policy. It feels it feels like um, even if the even if a government's ability to influence technology hasn't changed, people's perceptions of it have have changed over time and are becoming more more supportive. Um, the yeah, second I, concept. I think the other thing that's changed changing is. Um, the, the global aspect of innovation. So Tokamak Energy gets quite good uh, multi-million support from the US Department of Energy as, as well. Mm -hmm. So um, the idea of national champions and, and so on, when you're talking about a technology like fusion, which is ultimately going to be deployed uh, all around the world, mm -hmm then it, it's not unusual to see multiple governments uh, supporting technologies because they, they want to see it emerge uh, and they can see a, a benefit uh, from to, to being involved for for their country. Yeah, interesting. The, the, so the second, the second concept I have is nuclear fission as part of the global energy transition. Do you think its role is overrated or underrated? I think it might be underrated in this sense. It, I, I hear a lot of people who've kind of written it off. Mm. Uh, and it is true to say that um, the total number of uh, fission plants in the world isn't going up, even though some new ones uh, are being built. But there's quite a large installed base of uh, fission plants, and they have a very long life. Yeah, yeah. I don't think you can just write vision off. It's going to be there. I don't think it's going to be growing uh, exponentially or, or anything like that. But there's already quite a lot of installed capacity and it is, is reliable base load. You've only got to look at the UK grid on a not very sunny, not very windy day. And uh, it's a good job that those fission plants are there. Yeah, it's certainly producing a lot of zero carbon power in 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 the GB in the GB grid and many others. It's probably another one of those things where um, perceptions have changed over the last fifteen years in a, in a, in a sense. Um, and and perhaps the public, yeah, perhaps you're right. The sort of the you know read the newspaper and it's overwhelmingly negative. I think and perhaps the, the pendulum has, has swung a bit too far too far in that direction. Um, okay, the final concept I have is, and again, this, this goes outside of your current role, but I'm interested in it. T Tesla's capital market success so far. Do you think it's, and, and you know, you've been in the automotive industry for, for a long time. Do you think it's overrated or underrated? Well, what, you mean the present valuation? Yeah, I suppose that would be one way of looking at it. Um, 
you know, it's, I suppose it's reflected in the share price. Do you think, yeah, do you think that's overrated or underrated? I think the, the current share price probably anticipates um, Tesla becoming a much uh, bigger company with a much more significant role in the global uh, automotive market. You couldn't um, justify the current share price or anything like it uh, based on the number of cars they sell today at the margins at which they sell them. No. But no. it's a very fast, it's a very fast growing company and the people paying that price for the shares are probably assuming uh, that the company is going to become a heck of a lot larger and a heck of a lot more profitable. Mm. The current um, automotive industry would uh, possibly say, well, we think that's very unlikely because we've got a whole slew of electric cars uh, coming in, into the market and we plan to be just as successful in the electric car market as we have been in, in the um, petrol and diesel powered markets. So it, com it comes down to a question of can, uh, can Tesla become a, a, a dominant player? And yeah. uh, the incumbent industry would probably say, no, we, we don't think they can. But again, if you wind back a, a few years, how many of them would have been betting on them being as large and successful uh, and with the brand strength that they've already been able to develop? Yeah. Yeah, very, but very the, few. Uh, the, the naysayers for Tesla are probably assuming that uh, they can't go on to do e go on to do even greater things, and are looking at the current stratospheric price to earnings ratio. And uh, yes, it does look a bit frothy, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but it, some of that's froth, and some of that's how you see the the forward growth story and the response of the um, the, the existing industry whether they really really step up and push tes tesla's growth momentum back mm. yeah, it's one it's one everyone will have an opinion on I, I mean i think there are some parallels to the iphone and we've just seen apple at two two trillion uh, valuation so um so clearly it can be done on the on the back of brand strength and a, and a, and a high quality product it seems um, that's probably a natural time to finish. Thanks for thanks for going beyond nuclear power to conclude. Um, we've covered a lot of ground, and I think you know I think we're all probably a lot of humanity is wishing you a lot of success in your journey and hoping that um, you know you hit all the not the uncertainties but the milestones as you as you put them over the next decade to delivering fusion power to the grid. So Jonathan Carling, thanks so much for joining me. Thank you. That was John Federson, co-founder and chief executive of Aurora, talking to Jonathan Carling, CEO of Tokamak Energy. Do keep an eye on our podcast feed for more in-depth conversations with senior members of the energy industry. The best way to do this is to subscribe on whatever platform you use. Thanks for listening and goodbye. <laughs>